Okay, hello everybody, and uh, welcome to Frontline Genomics' latest webinar. Sorry? It's not working, you sure? I think it's late. My name is Joshua Neal, uh, and I'll be your host for this afternoon on behalf of the editorial team here at Frontline Genomics. Um, before we begin our journey into Promethion, uh, I'll quickly talk you through some of our house rules. Um, so first, uh, while we do try and make the quality of our podcasts as high as possible, um, on occasion, some of you might experience some audiovisual disruption. If that happens, uh, just let me know with a question in our question box, and um, I'll try and get back to you with the appropriate solution as soon as I can. Uh, secondly, uh, we do have a question and answer session uh, after the presentation's over. So if at any time you want to submit a question for our speakers, just uh, put a question in there, and I'll try and we'll try and go through as many as we can um, after the presentation's finished within the time that we have. Thirdly, since we all like to know that what we're doing is appreciated, uh, if you have any messages of support or compliments for our speakers, uh, or just want to let them know you've enjoyed the presentation, then just leave a comment, and uh, I'll do my best to let them know. And uh, finally, should you find yourself in need of leaving us before the hour has run its course, the recording of the session will be available on demand for you at leisure to view through the link you've accessed today. So, uh, on to today's exciting presentation. So, long reads characterization of structural variants, uh, and always tricky repetitive regions. That can only mean we're looking at the titan of the sequencing world, Oxford Nanopore Technologies Promethion. The two men taking us on this voyage of technical excellence are two of the brightest young stars of the University of Antwerp's neurology departments, Arne de Roeck and Wouter de Costa, early adopters and among the world's leading Promethion users. With that, uh, I'll hand over to our presenters to begin. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar. This is Arne de Rook speaking, and together with my colleague Wouter, we will talk about human genome sequencing on Promethean and the characterization of structural variants. And I'll first give the word to my colleague Wouter, who will start with the introduction. Hello. We are PhD students at the University of Antwerp in the VIB Center for Molecular Neurology in, Ant in, in Belgium. Um, we use nanopore sequencing and bioinformatics to investigate the contribution of structural variants to neurodegenerative, disease, neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal dementia. As early technology adopters, we have been part of the Minaren and Promethean access program since the beginning um, and have benefited really from this new technology. While we have received consumables and travel reimbursement, ONT did not have any influence on our work and this presentation. Now, structural variation, defined as a change in copy number or location of genomic elements larger than 50 nucleotides, includes deletions, duplications, inversions, translocations, repeat expansions, and complex combinations of, of the former. These variants are generally hard to characterize since short read technologies, which are currently dominant, are inadequate for this. Uh, that is because these align ambiguous, unambiguously to um, repetitive regions and do not allow spanning breakpoints. Well, long read sequencing potentially uh, could solve these issues and enable structural variant detection at an unprecedented resolution. Now we have tested if Oxford Nanopore Promethean enables large-scale studies of these variants and a potential application in a clinical setting, and we'll present our results during this webinar. In our webinar, we will start with a technical introduction and then uh, talk about the performance of the Promethean for human genomes. We'll give you an overview of structural, structural variants in the well-known genome. And later on, we'll zoom in on a tandem repeat expansion in ABCA7. We'll wrap up with uh, some perspectives about where the genomic field is going at. So I will start with a minimal technical introduction to give, get everyone on the same page about nanopore sequencing. Um, nanopore sequencing, so sequencing oligonucleotides through nano protein nanopores is not really a new idea, and, but it was only released five years ago with the, with the Menaian sequencer. We mostly use the, the Promethean sequencer, the, the biggest here uh, in the slide. And this is a high throughput machine which also enables uh, human world genome sequencing, which was not possible on the Minion and Gridion flow cells. Mm. 
Now, the, the yields you can see here in the slide are those obtained in the field and not necessarily those at ONT internally. So here you can see a standard workflow for human genetic studies, and this is quite important in the rest of our presentation. The procedure starts with library preparation, and we prefer to start with freshly extracted DNA from cell lines, which is then optionally sheared and size selected. Uh, later on, we perform the ONT Promethean uh, library preparation, which starts with end repair and ligation of specific adapters. Next is then the, the sequencing phase. And nucleotides uh, are here threaded to a protein uh, nanopore. So long single molecules are sequenced. And the sequ sequence is determined by measuring the disturbance in the electrical current when the nucleotide is passing through, through the pore. The speed of sequencing is controlled by a motor protein, which will slow down the strand to 450 nucleotides per second. Now, in detail, it looks like this. So the electrical current signal is characteristic for the sequence, uh, which is at that moment in the constriction of the pore. And the, the spiky current signal, as you can see here, is called a squiggle. In the base calling step, this squiggle is translated to nucleotides using a recurrent neural network, which is a machine learning technique. Base calling can be performed live while the run is ongoing. As we work in human genetics, we have evaluated Promethean sequencing on the human genome. Okay, so after this uh, introduction, I will give some more information of, on what we have been doing uh, with the Promethean platform. And so, um, basically, since February 2018, this was approximately the time when the high-quality flow cells for Promethean were released. We've been sequencing 27 sequencing runs on Promethean. Now, in our case, we used all of them to sequence human um, DNA to perform whole genome sequencing. Most of this uh, came from patients with dementia, with a Belgian ethnicity, but we also sequenced, for instance, the NA19240 Urban Reference Individual, for which we wanted to uh, create a high-coverage data set, and we will talk more about this later. Now, we want to use this data especially to call structural variants, and there's a couple of parameters that are really important here. At one, so for, first of all, we want to get um, sufficient sequencing reads, of course, so we want to get a high yield out of the platform. They need to be long enough to span the most difficult regions in the genome, and of course, we need sufficient quality to be able to call these variants. And I will talk a little bit more about these three uh, aspects. So first of all, the yield. So um, here are those 27 sequencing runs that we have performed on Promethean since February, and on average, by using the, um, the standard protocol that, that Walter talked about, we get up approximately 70 gigabases per sequencing run per flow cell. So that's a 22x genome coverage on one single Promethean flow cell. And our uh, highest result was a 110 gigabase sequencing run or a 34x genome coverage on one single Promethean flow cell. Now, I also highlighted a couple of um, exceptions here. So here are three sequencing runs that obtained relatively low yield. Now, this was because here we tried to experiment a little bit with older DNA extraction. So this was DNA that was extracted eight to 10 years ago. And probably what we think is happening is that this DNA was um, slightly damaged or maybe contained some components in the buffer that could have inter interfered with the entire Promethean sequencing process. And then there's a few other sequencing runs that also achieved less than 50 gigabases of output. And all of these were actually sequencing runs where we used unsheared DNA. So normally, we shear our DNA to approximately 10 to 20 KB uh, fragment length. But for these, we didn't shear it. And we just used the DNA as it came out of the cell. So these are sequencing runs with very long DNA fragments. And they also re resulted in a lower yield. But so overall, we get 70 gigabases of output uh, on one single flow cell. The same thing can also be seen for NA19240, for instance. So here we used five flow cells to generate a high coverage data set for this individual. And flow cell number one, three, and four in this case uh, were, also used, were also sequenced using um, unsheared DNA. And so as you can see, these also had lower yield than compared to flow cells two and five for which we sheared the DNA. So this brings me to the, the next um, aspect, which is uh, read length. So here again are those 27 runs, and there's a distribution 
of uh, the, the, the read length that was, that was achieved on a, on a log transformed scale. So what we see is that for all these runs, the majority of our reads are more than 10 KB long. We have a median read length and 50 of 12 KB, uh, but this also includes the less qualitative runs for, with degraded DNA, for instance. So in general, on a good sequencing run with a standard protocol, we can easily get more than uh, a, a, a 50 of more than 15 KB. Now the good thing about this is also that there is a very strong correlation with the DNA fragment size before library preparation and the sequencing read length. So for instance, here on the x-axis we show what the average fragment size is before we started the entire library preparation process, and then on the y-axis you see the average read length that is obtained after Promethean sequencing. There's one exception to this, which is uh, subject 10 in this case, and this particular individual actually had a degraded DNA sample. Um, we think that this could be due to um, NICs uh, or, or small damages in, in the DNA, but we're not completely sure. But if you use fresh DNA, then you get very strong correlations. And then finally, the, the quality of the sequencing runs. So um, here we show the, the percentage reference identity. So this means the similarity of the sequencing reads against the reference genome after base calling and alignment. Um, and we see that we get rather comparable qualities com um, when compared to MinIron. It is slightly lower, but this is prob probably because uh, base calling from Promethean is not yet as optimized as it is for MinIron, and we think that in the near future, these qualities will probably be um, exactly the same or something. And so with that, um, I would like to have an intermediate conclusion here by saying that we find that Promethean is very robust in sequencing with an average output of 70 gigabases per flow cell. For our purposes and our applications, we think that uh, it's best to use fresh DNA, to use DNA that is sheared to approximately 20 KB, and to use um, site selection uh, for more than 7 to 10 KB fragments. And so uh, Wouter will now talk further, and we will try to evaluate whether this data is sufficient enough to call structural variance. So we evaluated genome-wide structural variance discovery in the NA19 to 40 uh, Yoruban reference individual, which was also part of the 1000 Genomes and HapMap project, and has recently been characterized using modern technologies, including 10x genomics, TransSeq, BioNanoGenomics, and PacBio sequencing. And this gives us a comprehensive set of golden standard uh, variants. Uh, about 30,000 structural variants, which we can use to compare our data with. We sequenced this sample to high depth on Promethean and provide an independent evaluation of recently developed software tools. Our sequencing data is also available on ENA, and we hope it would be useful for the community. So we compared three aligners, Minimap2, LAST, and NGMLR, and variant calling using three structural variant callers, Sniffles, NanoSV, and uh, an NPINF, which is specifically developed for inversions. Here you can also see two examples of structural variants, with on the left uh, 100 nucleotides deletion, and on the right a small inversion. So um, we compared four uh, settings of aligners. And the Minimap2 is by far the fastest in this uh, analysis, and last is, is quite slow, and therefore maybe not applicable to larger sequencing projects. Uh, we also see that NGMLR creates, on average, longer alignments, while last has the tendency to split a single read in, in multiple split alignments. And based on um, these alignments, we have uh, done variant calling using using all uh, the three variant calls. It turned out that last alignment is incompatible with structural variant calling by Sniffles and NPINF. So for that aligner, we only used NanoSV. Mm, and as you can see, the, the number of variants identified varies quite widely, with in general more variants identified by, by NanoSV. Remember that the uh, expected number of structural variants is around 30,000. It is also clear that Sniffles is, is lots faster than, than NanoSV. And based on our golden standard variant set, we could evaluate the precision, which is the proportion of variants which are uh, correctly identified, 
and the, the recall, the proportion of the correct variants which were identified in our test set. And an ideal set would have both a high precision and a high recall. And in our analysis, Minimap 2 followed by Sniffles variant calling performs the best. And we're quite lucky because that's also the fastest combination in our set. Now, um, comparing this with Illumina data, which in this case was called using Manta, shows that we have a substantial increase in structural variants detected, which translates to thousands and thousands of variants which are only detected in the, the long read data set. By integrating um, the, the variants from Sniffles and NanoSP, we can create both a high confidence and a high sensitivity set by taking respectively the intersection and the union of the, of the two variant cars, which can further boost the uh, confidence, the, the precision and the recall to 75%. But this also shows that a substantial proportion of the variants are still missing, uh, which gives opportunities to the, uh, develop new, new software. By randomly downsampling the alignment, we can also see that uh, increasing the coverage above 40x adds relatively less to the discovery of novel true variants. So this gives an, us an indication for future projects uh, which coverage is sufficient. By looking at the length of the identified variants, we can see that the, the majority of the variants around 50 to 100 nucleotides um, is, is in that group, and a uh, substantial of these variants are not entirely accurate. So there's definitely room for improvement in, in that uh, length. And we also see a, a characteristic peak around 306,000 nucleotides, which corresponds to structural variants involving respectively ALU and L1 elements. Uh, on the, the right panel here, you can also see the types of variants which were identified, which most dominantly, dominantly are uh, deletions. Now, uh, we also looked specifically at inversions, and these are generally very uh, tricky to identify, as they, these breakpoints break are in highly repetitive regions. And it's currently quite hard with other technologies to detect these inversions, as these are also copy number neutral. Now, um, it's also in our data sets that these inversions are generally poorly identified, and we observed the best results using NP-INF uh, with a precision up to only 34%, and only a quarter of the variants are identified. Uh, potentially longer read length in, could make a, a difference in, uh, in this set of variants. Now, we devel developed and released a workflow for discovery and annotation of structural variants, uh, which is scalable to call um, structural variants from an individual or for entire populations. And we integrate many existing tools using the SnakeMake workflow language. This workflow and our other scripts for visualization and accuracy evaluation are available on GitHub. From this part, we can conclude that tens of thousands of structural variants can be detected using Promethean, of which many cannot be found using Illumina sequencing. With the best results, we are obtained uh, with, with sniffles after Minimap 2 alignment, but inversions are still very inaccurate. Comprehensive detection of sexual variants is possible from 40x coverage, and the, the influence of read length on the sexual variant detection remains to be evaluated. Now we'll specifically zoom in on uh, tandem repeat expansions in ABC7. Okay, so yes, in this next part we'll take um, a look at a more specific case of, of structural variants, and uh, we'll, we'll apply this to a more clinically relevant um, tandem repeat. So we recently identified the expanded alleles in a ABCS7 VNTR, so that's a tandem repeat with um, 25 base pair tandem repeat units, um, has a high chance of increasing your risk of Alzheimer's disease. So if you have an expansion in this VNTR, you have a four times higher chance of developing disease. Now, unfortunately, only sodium loading can be used at this point to characterize this tandem repeat. And sodium loading is limited to giving you an estimation of the 
of the length of the stand and repeat, which is often inaccurate, especially at very at long lengths. And furthermore, it's a very low throughput technique that really precludes the application of this, this VMTR in, in the clinic. And furthermore, also um, causes that we can't really do very large scale screenings of the stand and repeat and uh, in depth characterization. So we want to find out whether we can use Promethea now to really um, sequence Alzheimer's disease patients and whether we can use it to find these expanded tandem repeat units. And in addition to just determining the length of this tandem repeat, we also want to look into the sequence of this VMTR. And as you can see, the sequence on the bottom right, it is a very GC-rich tandem repeat, so it's a very uh, difficult sequence to go through. Now, um, as, as we've talked about earlier, this is the canonical pipeline, basically, in, in human genetics to call variants. And the same kind of algorithms also exist for tandem repeats. Now, using base calling and alignment, however, is kind of tricky on, on these tandem repeats because they are very difficult sequences, and very GC-rich, which, which are often, and repetitive, which are often difficult for base callers to get very high accuracy for. In addition, because each individual has a different length of these tandem repeats, um, it's difficult to align these reads to a reference genome and to get uh, very uh, accurate results. And also, we ideally want to have sequencing reads that span these tandem repeats from the start until the end. And if you have tandem repeat alleles that, have, that are more than 10,000 bases long, you also need very long spanning um, sequencing reads that are, do not stop in the middle of that. So there's a couple of existing algorithms already out there. Um, I will talk here a little bit more about tandem genotypes, so which is basically based on first base calling the Promethean data, then doing a reference alignment, and then um, doing a variant calling by the tandem genotypes alignment. And so, <clears throat> in first instance, we wanted to evaluate different base callers and see how they performed on this particular tandem repeat. So in this figure here, we're comparing three different base callers, Albacore, Scrappy Events, and Scrappy Raw. Now, each dot in these figures corresponds to the estimated tandem repeat length of one sequencing read. And the red reads are originating from the positive DNA strand, so the one that contains a lot of cytosines. The blue reads are coming from the upper strand, so that the negative strand, which um, corresponds to a sequence with a lot of guanines in. Now, these dashed lines on these figures correspond to the expected length of the standard repeat that we have identified with southern blotting. Now, when we look at Albacore, firstly, for instance, we see that there is uh, a very big difference in length estimations coming from the positive strand or from the negative strand. In addition, we see that most of these length estimates are actually quite far away from what we would expect based on southern blotting, so there is a low accuracy. And in addition, there is a quite large spread on, on, spread on these, these, these length estimates, so there's a large um, standard deviation and a low precision. Then we see a similar kind of thing when we use scrappy events. The, um, the, the, the direction of the effect is a little bit different with negative reads now suddenly um, estimated to be larger than the positive reads, but still there is a low accuracy and a big spread on, on the estimates. But then when we look at Scrappy Raw, actually, we see that the estimates of tandem repeat length become much better. And the strand bias effect is mostly gone now. We also see that the estimates are corresponding closely to what we would expect from southern blotting, so we have a high accuracy, and there is uh, less deviation on these results. So Scrappy Raw, based on these analysis, actually looks quite good. But then when we look at the really long tandem repeat alleles, the expanded alleles of this ABCS7 VNTR, we see that this um, scrappy raw base color is not performing as well as for the others. So here in this particular case, we're looking at three individuals that have very long ABCS7 VNTR alleles. So on the y-axis, by the way, you can see the number of tandem repeats. So if an individual has 400 tandem repeats, that means that this is a 10 KB um, allele because the tandem repeat unit is 25 base pairs. And so we see that while Albacore and scrappy events are usually okay in identifying these expanded reads, then Scrappy Raw is um, not able to traverse them because of some kind of reason. And then in addition, when we want to look at um, the differences in sequence between these different tandem repeat units, we see that there's actually quite a lot of, of errors introduced in this sequence due to base calling. So there's quite a lot of, of mismatches and, and indels, which we cannot polish because we do not have a reference genome for uh, the standard repeats. So we cannot rely on existing tools, for instance, to improve the accuracy of our base calling. 
And so this is why we decided to look for an alternative approach than this classical um, human genetics paradigm, basically. And the idea was very simple, that if base calling and reference alignment are causing problems, then we can try to circumvent these steps and perform tandem repeat assessment directly on the raw Promethean data. And so this figure here, for instance, shows you what a uh, raw sequencing read from nanopore sequencing looks like. In this particular case, it's a sequencing read that goes through a uh, expanded allele of the ABCS7 VNTR. And as you can probably appreciate, you can see that identifying this tandem repeat is actually quite easy. I mean, because it's always the repetition of exactly the same motif, these things really stand out from the normal flanking sequences. And so we decided to look into pattern, rec pattern, pattern recognition al algorithms to um, see whether we can identify these standard repeats and whether we can segment them in separate units. And so we found out that dyna dynamic time warping is probably the best method to perform this. And for those that know the read until software from, for, for Minayan, for instance, um, this is exactly the same principle here that we use pattern recognition on these raw squiggle data to identify patterns of interest. So this is a little bit more a representation of what that dynamic time warping do. Thus, in this particular case, you see two squiggles on the left that correspond to two tandem repeat units. And what dynamic time warping does is it tries to find the best alignment between these two patterns, and it also creates you a, a gives you a distance of similarity, basically, of, or the, the opposite of similarity between these two sequences. And so if we then look again at these sequencing reads, so this is again a sequencing read that, that traverses an entire tandem repeat. In this case, it's a smaller one. So what we did is we developed an algorithm that we called nanosatellite that can delineate these tandem repeats and can then therefore also segment them into different units. And so for this particular case, this is what it would look like if you release nanosatellite on uh, this particular sequencing grid. So we can find out where these different units are. Now, if you then want to determine the length of this tandem repeat, you just simply have to count the number of tandem repeat units. And so we did that for all the samples um, that we sequenced. And in this particular case, for instance, we show a comparison for the NA19240 sample. And what we see is that we obtain a better accuracy using the squeal-based algorithm than what we expect from the base colors. Also, we see a similar precision as we obtained with Scrappy Raw, but most importantly for us also, and more, most uh, clinically ap applicable, is that we are really good in this way in identifying sequencing reads that span the very large expanded alleles, which is um, very important for clinical research. And also the uh, estimated sizes that we obtain in this way for these expanded reads are actually quite close to southern blotting. And the difference here that we see between the expected sizes by southern blotting and our estimations based on Promethean sequencing are also probably caused by a, um, a lack of, of accuracy in southern blotting. And so secondly, we want to find out whether we can use these squiggles to determine the sequence of this uh, tandem repeat. And so what we did here is we basically took all these different tandem repeat units and we clustered them against each other. So we compared this raw Promethean squiggle data for each different tandem repeat unit against all other tandem repeat units. And if you make two groups out of this, for instance, you cluster this data based on the biggest difference between them, and then you can get this kind of squiggles, as you can see on the top right corner. And so you have one group, which is the blue group, and the other group is the orange group. And as you can see, mostly across the entire unit, they are the same, but in the middle, they show a big difference between them, which is actually caused by a SNP in this VNTR tandem repeat unit. And so we can use this now. We can use these different clusters to determine the sequence of this tandem repeat. And so here in this figure, we show all kinds of individual sequencing reads that originate from the same VNTR allele. And so the pink rectangles here correspond to a normal tandem repeat unit, while the green ones correspond to a tandem repeat unit that contains a SNP in them. And as you can see, if we look at different Sequencing reads but coming from the same allele, we see the same pattern reoccurring all the time. So we see that we can get a quite consistent determination of the sequence of tandem repeat units uh, based on, 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 on at a single read uh, resolution, basically. 
What we can also do with this data is we can look um, at homozygotes, for instance. So this, for instance, is an individual that has only one fragment of southern blotting. So either it has two VNTR alleles of the same length, or um, it's possible that you miss one allele in southern blotting due to technical difficulties. We sequence this individual, and then when we look at the sequence of the standard repeat alleles, for instance, we see that there's clearly two groups of, of alleles that have a similar length, and so we can show you that this individual is indeed a homozygous, at least an individual with a homozygous uh, VNTR length. And so with that, I would like to conclude this part here by saying that we can use Promethean to study um, expanded tandem repeats in, in, in human genomes, right? So we, we see that with one flow cell, we obtain uh, sufficient coverage to, to call these difficult, difficult reason, th these difficult regions, and we were able to span all tandem repeat alleles that we tested, so from ranging from 1 kb to more than 10 kb, and we developed a nanosatellite um, algorithm that is able to get high accuracy and precision to find out the length of these tandem repeats and the sequence as well. So we get some very nice uh, single read accuracy, and this also opens a lot of um, opportunities in this tandem repeat research. And uh, one of the future steps that we would like to do is to look at nucleotide modifications, for instance, within these tandem repeats uh, using this squiggle algorithm, and this is something that we're currently working on. To wrap up our webinar, I'll go again over the main conclusions. I would also like to highlight our preprints, which we recently shared on BioArchive, in which most of this is published. We welcome all feedback on our work there. So Promethean sequencing is a robust technique for human genome sequencing, and we obtain an average throughput of 70 gigabase per flow cell. In the case, we can use uh, freshly extracted DNA, sheared to 20 kb, and use size selection. More than 25,000 structural variants can be identified from these long reads, and we get the uh, best and fastest results using the combination Minimap2 with Sniffles. We also see that high, very challenging tandem repeats, including kilobase large expansions, can be assessed reliably. As the impact of structural variants and repetitive content in both health and disease is currently insufficiently understood, we need more long-read sequencing datasets to detect previously hidden variation across multiple populations for a more comprehensive overview of genomic diversity. An increase of nucleotide level accuracy for long-read sequencing technology would enable truly world genome sequencing and detect all variation but for now, the combination of short, accurate reads and long reads provides the most complete results. Finally, we would like to acknowledge our colleagues and funders, and especially the people from the Neuromics Support Facility who have been instrumental in making this work possible. We would like to thank you for your attention, and we would be happy to take your questions. Okay, thank you both very much for that presentation. Um, I'll move on in a minute to some questions uh, that I and the audience have. Uh, so obviously, um, everyone at home, if you want to ask a question, feel free to just put it in the chat box now, and I'll hopefully get round to it. Um, so the first thing um, that I've noticed was sent in by H. Kelkar, um, and he mentioned uh, that you said about 27 individual flow cell runs, and he's questioning that since Promethean can run 481 times. So you do want to talk further about um, sort of runs that you can do in parallel, and that sort of thing. Well, um, currently we mostly do one or a few flow cells at the same time, um, since we also have to prepare libraries, and this is not immediately a high throughput uh, library prep method. Perhaps automation could solve some issues here. In our current Promethean device, it's only possible to use 24 flow cells at one time, and expansion to 48 is expected in the following months. So currently, these are mostly individual flow cells, uh, or a few together. And, and also, I would like to say that um, sequencing on one flow cell, for instance, will give you two, terabi uh, two terabytes of, of data. So. Um, we sometimes sequence up to four flow cells at the same time, 
But if you really want to go for 48 flow cells at the uh, same time, you you need very very strong um, informatic structures to to handle that amount of data. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, we do have two related questions uh, about sort of costs. So um, uh, Alexei Larionov is asking, uh, what is the cost estimate for 40 times whole genome on promethion? And we also got Anthony Griswold who asks whether you can give the estimated cost per WGS on the promethion. So uh, do you know those two sort of things about cost? Um, so okay, the, the, the main cost uh, for this sequencing is the cost of the flow cells. Now, um, the, I think these prices are on the website of Oxford Nanopore Technologies, and it varies a lot about, uh, based on how many flow cells you order, right? So if you if you want to sequence a, a couple of thousand genomes, then it's not not that expensive. I think it's only six hundred dollars or a little bit more between six hundred and seven hundred dollars per flow cell. But you have, if you use very low amounts of flow cells, like one, two, three, or whatever, then you have um, yeah, the costs go up, and I think those prices are on on the website. Um, yes, the, the prices definitely are on the website. And the question was specifically about a 40-fold coverage genome. Well, with the current flow cells, you would need, in our hands, two flow cells to get 40-fold coverage. But uh, also, the people at Oxford Nanopore themselves have recently uh, gained a flow cell with, with 200 gigabase of sequencing data. And we also see that in the, the past month or two months even, um, the throughput has increased enormously. So right now it's unsure what uh, is the upper limit on, on yield. What's maybe also uh, interesting to mention is that you don't have to buy the machine actually. So you only buy the flow cells, um, but in, in, in contrast to let's say Illumina or Pike Bio sequencing, you don't have to buy the, the actual sequencer. And that's also a, a big difference, I think. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Umaima Tarua, I apologize, I apologize if I butchered the name, but uh, I think I might have done it a fair bit this webinar, asks, can we use this technology to detect pathologic variants with higher accuracy in epileptic families? Well, if those pathologic variants are structural variants, then yes, you, you at this moment you, you definitely can. And there is also a difference between identifying new variants or genotyping known variants. So if you're interested in variants which you know that are pathogenic, then it's definitely feasible to genotype those, while discovery of SNPs of small variants uh, is probably more noisy right now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I just have a couple of my own in terms of sort of what you're doing generally. Um, so uh, what were the main challenges when you were uh, doing this research? And uh, so how did you approach those while you were doing it? Well, okay, so um, yeah, because we, we are working on, on human genomes, we really need um, a lot of data to get sufficient coverage uh, for them. So, I mean, a lot of people that, that started out with nanopore sequencing, for instance, uh, do that um, on bacterial genomes, for instance, which for which you can get quite easily, basically, your coverage also using a Minion platform. But for us, if you really want to get some some um, some some accurate base, some accurate um, structural variants out of it, for instance, we need let's say at least a 10x coverage, and for that you really need the high yield. And that's only been possible, I think, at least sequencing on single flow cells since uh, February of this year. Yes. Uh, we have also gone to evaluation of how can we best optimize our library prep, including the sharing, including the fresh DNA, and including the site selection. And this has also taken some time to get to the results that we can present today. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's another question by Daniel Sommer from uh, NBACC. He wants to know uh, whether you ran all three base callers on the Promethean instrument locally, uh, or copy signal data and base call on a separate machine. On the Promethean itself, the Guppy base caller is used, which is the, the most recent base caller from Oxford Nanopore Technologies. And that base caller essentially uses the same algorithm as AlbaCore, but it's only uh, implemented faster and more efficient. To use the other base callers, we had to copy the data to our, uh, to our network uh, and run the, the base callers locally. Okay, thank you very much. Um, 
Another question that I have, um, while we're potentially waiting for any others, uh, what do you intend to do next with your research? Where is it going to go from here? Well, um, since we are also um, mostly invested as a, as a neurological center, and we have access to a quite big biobank, I, I think it would be e it would be interesting to sequence, for instance, DNA that is coming from 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 the brain of patients, let's say, because in that case, you can also start looking into uh, epigenetic modifications and like uh, methylation, for instance, in these brain regions. But also because we see, it, for instance, let's say for the tandem repeats, that we find this single read accuracy. We can start looking for somatic mutations, for instance, in, in brain tissue as well. I think that would be very interesting, um, especially you know, in, in my case, I'm interested in tandem repeats, but also we see that most of these known tandem repeat expansions for now, for instance, are really coming from um, the neuro neurodegenerative diseases. And so there's probably a bit more also to find in these tandem repeats and uh, neurodegeneration. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that's all the questions we have for now, so I'll start wrapping up. I'll just mention uh, as well that uh, Ying Song Chen from the National Chongqing University uh, thanks you for the presentation, so uh, it's definitely appreciated. Um, apart from that, and any further questions we might get, uh, I think that's really all we have for this webinar. Um, I'll close by thanking uh, you two, Anna and Walter, for your presentation. Um, as well as thanking our great audience for making this, uh, you know, an engaging and lively event. Uh, before I'm going to leave, I'd just like to add that uh, Frontline Genomics' uh, new festival launches next week, so look out for more information on that uh, on our website and at uh, festivalgenomics-london.com. Uh, FLG also has six e-books, which are available on the main FLC website for free download, uh, covering topics like cloud computing, gene editing, and uh, clinical genomics, if you want to read more about those. Um, but really, I think that's it. Thank you both very much again. Uh, it was a pleasure. Uh, and uh, that's it for now. Thanks. Bye. They didn't say goodbye.